What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. In this episode, we are talking about building brands. I've got a very special guest with me today, Kevin. Kevin, quickly introduce yourself. What's going on, guys? My name is Kevin. Thanks for having me, Craig. I run an ice jewelry brand for men. We, uh, it's called Ice Mob. Yeah, so seven figure jewelry brand owner. So obviously I also have some brands as well. I have a sweets brand and I also have home goods brands as well. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So what are some quick tips, three quick tips for someone that's looking to start a brand or has just started a brand? Like what do they do? Probably the number one thing that I've learned the past year is focus on the basics. Like it's, for me, that's been the biggest unlock for growth in the past year was literally just dialing around the basics, not doing, not focusing shit on like advanced tactics or like complexities or whatnot. Like literally it's product content and supply chain, like staying in stock and shipping on time. Like really a brand is not much more complicated than that. Um, and so when you can just master the basics, that's where a lot of growth will come. Um, at least it was for us. So what do you mean by kind of the basics and stuff like this? So are you just purely just really focusing on that first purchase? Are you focusing on returning customers? Like die, go a little bit further into that. I think a lot of it's like what you spend your time on. So for a long time, I was trying to do a bunch of whole different shit. Like I was just spreading myself too thin. And when I really took a step back and was like, okay, I'm, I run a brand and what a brand does essentially is it sells a product. And so like, what is a good product? Like, how do we make the product better? Um, how do we make better content for, for this brand? Like, it's it's the very simple stuff. Like, if you ask someone off the street, like, how do you build a brand? They would probably tell you a few things. And like, those are like 80% of what you should be spending your time on, honestly, for um, at least it's what 80% 80, 80 of what we spend our time on. And it's, it's been unlocking a lot of growth, like just improving the product every day, trying to create better content every single day, like better quality content, more volume of content, and then supply chain. Um, constantly trying to meet demand and staying in stock while trying to scale. Like that's a very big problem, but it's, it's important to solve. And like, those are the basics, you know what I mean? Yeah, it makes sense. In terms of content, then what are you focusing on right now to, to acquire new customers? Right now, a lot of our efforts on ads. So, um, we were able to like three X basically our monthly revenue in the past, like six months, like we had our biggest month ever. And it really just came from running more ads, like testing more ads. Um, Shout out to my boy Zan over there, but he he's he's the one who's been doing a lot of it. But like, just testing more more volume of creative and also a higher quality of creative, is is was like the biggest unlock in terms of marketing. So what kind of would you be able to kind of share anything in terms of what kind of advertising are you mainly focusing on in the actual creatives? Are you doing kind of photo creatives? Are you do anything a little bit different in that side of things? And then also, what platforms are you focusing on? So we're almost all of it's on Facebook, Instagram ads, but the biggest, like our, like our biggest style of ads is video creatives. And the core philosophy is provide as much value in the video as possible. And it's it's kind of a new philosophy, not like new, but like it's not done much in ads. It's a huge thing in short form, right? It's like, oh, provide value, provide value. But not many e-com brands are doing it with ads. That's why we've been able to like, pretty much like win pretty hard with that. Um, so what we'll basically do is like, we'll create an ad and We'll spend the first like 30 to 40 seconds of like a 60 second ad literally just providing value whatever it is right educating them about ice jewelry um you know just like some fun video like interesting entertaining right value can be entertainment educational and just spending the first like 30 seconds at least like providing as much value as possible and then we kind of like smoothly transition into actually selling the product and whatnot but like that style of video has been really good and then obviously the editing is massively important like making sure the editing is on point constantly engaging like retaining them and the hook, again, very important. Um, I think a big thing people get confused with with the hook is like, people have this kind of outdated idea that a hook is just like three seconds of the first video. Like, oh, it's like a fucking put a, a like a bitch twerk in there. It's like a oh, hook, boom. <laughs> like, not really. In my opinion, the best hook is actually the entire video concept. So like a good hook, it spans more than just the first three to five seconds. It's like, it's literally the first half of the video. It's like, what is the concept of this video that makes them want to watch? So it's not just like, like you can't, people aren't stupid. Like you don't just fake stuff and then people like want to watch it. Like you just, it, like you really know, no getting away. There's no way to get around it. Like you just pro provide as much value. Like make yeah, it, you can't cheat it. Yeah, you can't cheat it. Like, and I think for a while you could on TikTok, which is why that kind of like blew up. It's like, oh, you just like add this like shocking clip and then, but it doesn't really work anymore. You know, like you, you genuinely need really good quality content. Is most of your efforts now just purely like the advertising side of things, paid side of things, or do you any do you do any organic? Yeah, so actually it's been all ads up until now, but literally this month we were starting to do organic. Because a lot of the ads, like I said, we've been focusing so much on value, 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 we realized they're actually kind of working on organic. So we just took a small step, like, okay, like let's just start posting on organic. 
um, it's kind of the not rules, but like frameworks I try to think of when I'm thinking of ads is like, would this perform on short uh, on organic? Because it's it's way harder to make a video go viral on organic than it is to make a profitable ad. But when you can do both, like, yeah, that's like a mark of a good ad in my opinion. Yeah, that's that's super good. That's actually super valuable. Like that, that's super good. Um, in terms of kind of getting customers back again and again and again, because obviously my brand, the biggest one, the, the main one I really talk about is consumable products. Mm. And it's a good product. We have a large range of products as well. So a lot of SKUs. So it's very easy for someone to kind of come back because they eat it. That's like sweets, they eat it and then they buy again. Like it's pretty simple. But in terms of, obviously yours is not consumable. It's mm -hmm. So how do you convince people to come back again and again and again? And is that actually a main focus right now? Or is it just first purchase? That's a really good question. Like it definitely is a massive focus of ours, but um, like obviously the simple is like email, SMS, like retention, you know, whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I think at least for fashion, fashion brands, um, like number one is releasing more products and releasing fucking phenomenal products like really what, what how else do you get someone to come back and purchase again like if, if they've already seen your entire catalog and like they chose to buy this it's like okay like they probably need a new product to like come back and be interested i mean also you, you get like email like like that's i feel like that's a given like just have good flows set up like email consistently like um create good content on social media make them buy into the brand and like that will definitely increase i, I also yeah this is oh shit sorry i think that's another thing is brand um just building a trying to build a brand with a deep emotional connection well, with the customer or niche because people people buy people want to wear like they they, they want to buy a brand as a way to join a tribe right it's not really to, to buy a product i mean i'm speaking mostly on, on fashion right this is no we do the same thing with yeah. the licorice stuff we do the same thing so we really on all of our packaging it says my name and my founder's name and my co-founder's name as well so we really try to push that we created a good product. We do a lot of branding emails. It's funny, the best, the second best emails that work for us, number one is obviously sales, mm -hmm. like massive, like flash sales, stuff like this. Yeah. The number two category of emails that work really well for us is brand updates. So mm -hmm. our historically one of our best emails is we've moved warehouse, thank you so much. Wow. And then it was just a button at the bottom, shop now. Yeah. Like did not mention the product once in the thing, did not promotion promo anything yeah. but that works super well and then it's always the branding stuff that works really really well for us because it's not pushing them at all to sell uh, to buy and they just buy it anyways yeah that's that's sick bro that's really sick I, I, I'm a big fan of just doing emails that aren't dude like I, I kind of cringe whenever I see brands that are just constantly emailing sales and, and promotions and like whatever like and I understand like if you're a direct response focused brand like you, that's your goal but in my opinion like literally just yeah updating the customers about what the brand is doing um like we send a lot of motivational emails because our niche is like like we're trying to build the best ice jewelry for the relentless man and so we send emails based on that and i would say 80 percent of our emails don't have any mention of any product even like literally don't even mention a product just a tiny cta at the very end after giving like a whole email of motivation just like if you want like shop now like that's been working well for us and i think it it grows the brand as opposed to harvesting it constantly, uh, which is the approach I take because I'm, I'm trying to build Ice Mob for like 10 years, dude. Like I'm three years in and I want to do this for like at least another seven. I don't see myself stopping really, like maybe longer. And so I, I approach everything with a very long-term approach, like what will be best for the brand 10 years from now? And that's a big thing I've learned from, you know, some of, the, some of the fashion brands I look up to and also Jeff Bezos, like you read his fucking shareholder, letters to shareholders, like bro, all he talks about is future value for the for the company like he's just obsessed with that and that's why they i mean among many other reasons like that's a part of why they dominated so hard they, they, he just took a longer term approach than everyone else was going to do i've actually read a bunch of them as well go to like a bunch of the original Gold, ones as well bro. they're so fucking good they're so good so how do you go about for a jewelry brand right like how do you build that brand because it's like you've got to basically force people into giving a shit about your brand about ice bob and about the kind of culture behind the brand how do you go about that? Like, what is your strategy to actually build brand and build brand loyalty as well? Yeah, that's a good question. And to be fair, we're, we're in the middle of it. You know, um, for a long time, I was confused. And this is why I said the basics, because for a long time, I was confused with the complexities. I wasn't really sure what building a brand was. And now it's very clear to me what, what our path for building a brand is, is consistently designing like the sickest products and consistently creating content that uh, resonates with our target audience and makes them feel like they're joining a tribe that either they aspire to be or like they feel like they already are a part of. And so 
just like creating content that aligns with the lifestyle of whoever you're trying to target. Um, either, yeah, like I said, either it's like already they're living that lifestyle or they want to be like, like Rolex, they, they show a lifestyle that you want to be. Um, it's aspirational. Same with Mercedes. Like, and just, I think, reiteration of core brand principles. Like you should, like what we've been really trying to do is simplify our entire brand into like one um, word almost. Like to get it extremely simple because customers forget you know, you can't expect customers to, to remember a lot about you when they watch a 60 second ad out of the fucking 10,000 videos they watch a day. Like, so just trying to simplify the brand. Uh, that's something I got from Virgil Abloh, like uh, watching his videos, studying his stuff. Like he always talks about simplify, simplify, simplify. Make your customers remember just, if they can just remember one thing about your brand, like that's a, that's a dub, bro. Like, um, so constantly creating content that reiterates the core theme and also creating products that reiterate the core theme and just basically being obsessed with that one core theme and just doing it across every t brand touch point you possibly can. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, like I think a lot of people really get caught up in, they kind of think their brand's a lot bigger than they are and customers actually remember who they are more than they actually really do. Most people don't give a shit. Most people kind of, yeah. they have so many other things happening and so many other brands in their kind of life almost, in their life and the products and they purchased before that they don't remember what one brand stands for. Like they've opened one out of the last 10 emails and they bought from that one email and that's it. Like they don't give a shit. They don't care that much about the brand necessarily. Yeah. Um, one thing that's super interesting for the, for the licorice brand, I think like we have some customers that obviously you've been running three years, basically kind of the same time. Um, but you put a lot more effort than I have to be honest. Um, but we have customers that have purchased from us like three years ago that are still buying from us today. I think our number one customer has purchased from us almost 70 times now, 70 unique <laughs> times. Nice, bro. And we have a bunch of customers that have spent over like 1.5 and stuff like this. Do you, do you really focus, like how, how are your kind of email flows set out? Do you really focus on kind of the second, third, fourth, fifth? Do you have like detailed kind of stuff for the, for the future purchases? Or are you really just focusing on, okay, this is the best product ever, customers are gonna buy this? Yeah, we don't have too advanced email flows because, yeah, I guess you, I think you touched on it. Like, I think those type of like super long, intricate email strategies, like they're important, but at a certain scale, like we're at seven figures. Like, I really don't think that's even like really worth it until we're at like eight, nine figures to really invest that much time and effort into all these detailed flows and segmentation and whatnot. Like right now, it's for us, it's like the basics. The path to get to eight figures is literally more marketing, more content and more better product. And that's it. And that's the same playbook. It's going to take us to get to nine figures, like, and, and beyond. It's literally just focus all our time on creating the better product. Like if you, if you <clears throat> have two businesses, two businesses that compete each other, everything, everything's equal. Founders are the same. One founder's focused on, you know, creating these intricate email flows. And the other one's just literally dialed in on product for fucking five years. Like who do you bet on to win? And it's going to be the product guy yeah, every time. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So going back to kind of product, obviously supply chain is a hugely important part of that. How have you improved the supply chain over the past three years? Did, did it originally start as drop shipping and then you transitioned over? Yeah, our, our brand started drop shipping. We, um, yeah, we started drop shipping and then about seven months in, we transitioned to like a 3PO, white label, whatnot. And then since then it's grown a, a lot different from that. Like I've invested a lot of time, like I said, in the product, making sure the product, like little intricacies about the product that, you know, no one will, no one will think about, no one will know except for the end customer. Um, because that's really what matters. And so like, I just came back from a trip to China um, about a month long there just to visit the factory, visit the manufacturers, you know, see them in person and also dial in on the, the little intricacies of quality and quality control, you know, so, you know, uh, production times, lead times, um, like negotiating payment terms, like all that type of stuff. Supply chain, I think is actually, what I've been learning is like all the killers in e-com I've met, bro, they've all spent like a couple months in China. It's kind of interesting, like almost without fail. I think it's almost like a rite of passage, but like once you once you go there and actually see how everything works and like you visit all the markets and stuff like that, like you understand the supply chain on a deeper level and you also see like, it just, it's just like, it, dude, it's like where the, where the world's products are made and you get so inspired there. But um, I spent a lot of time, yeah, just improving quality there. Um, I think another big thing about supply chain is inventory forecasting. Like that's another yeah. huge basic that it's like super basic on 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 the surface but it's like super hard it's to so do. complicated yeah so annoying dude it's like one of the biggest challenges of i think honestly any brand is staying in stock um it's so difficult to forecast and so spending like good amount of time on that on, on top of that it's 
like capital management and forecasting on, on that on that end like how do you um like having payment terms having negative cash conversion cycles like shit like that like you can search up how Gymshark used that to fucking scale without having to raise capital. Like it's super important to have those things set up. We we could not be functioning right now without negative cash conversion cycles because we're trying to scale actually very quickly in the next like four or five months. And if we didn't have negative negative cash conversion cycles, we would basically be out of capital. Like we um, we're betting big, you know. Because here's the other thing about like inventory management that I've learned is that if you want a five x your revenue. I say this all the time, but if you want to five X your revenue, it literally requires you to five X the inventory purchase. But it's like such a simple concept, but a lot of people don't actually think about it. Like we want to five X, we want to five X. They do really well in the marketing and, and they just run out of stock. And it's like, you need to just have that confidence to place the five X inventory order. Like it's, it's a lot of fucking money. You know what I mean? But you, in order to grow five X, like you need to place that order. You need to take the leap of faith and the courageous always win, you know? So. Yeah, that's like literally was our biggest problem last year. Um, from the Etsy point of view is we were doing a lot of bulk shipping. Now we've kind of switched over to a lot of drop shipping as well because mm -hmm. it's purely just, there's no brand there. It's just first purchase only, right? 0.1% returning customers. Mm -hmm. So we literally, we sold out of everything like so quickly. Wow. Like we were really like beginning, probably like 10 days into November, we were selling out of shit like already, like we were going crazy. And for some products, for some SKUs, we had to double our pricing just to Damn. reduce orders that much. Damn. And then I realized I made a massive mistake and the pricing could have been way higher anyway because I doubled the price. No, I increased the pricing for a lot of items like 25, 40%, and then okay. the order stayed the exact same. Wow. And I was like, fuck, I could have increased the price a lot, <laughs> a lot sooner. But yeah, like, that's the biggest thing. I mean, what I've seen recently in the past, say like year and a half is the sales side of stuff, especially with the Etsy stuff that I do, but the sales side of stuff, like actually getting more orders in isn't normally the problem that I'm dealing yes. with. The problem I'm actually dealing with is managing the operations and managing the back end of stuff, whether that's like supply chain or whether that's just like employee stuff. Yeah. It's like that's the bigger problem, especially this Q4, that's gonna be the bigger problem for me is like actually managing the back end the supply chain. It's not gonna be, okay, can I get enough orders in today? It's gonna be, do I have enough stock yeah. to do all these fucking orders today? Or do I have enough staff members in the warehouse to ship out all these orders? Yeah. This is probably gonna be the biggest problem for us this year. But what do you, what are your kind of Q4 plans, right? So Q4 is like, obviously we just come into Q4. I think this will be released in a, probably a few weeks, but we've just come into Q4 now. It's the beginning of October. And I've spent a lot of time planning it. We've done a lot of kind of bulk stock stuff. And now we've even, we've moved some managers up to where our warehouse is and we're starting to get staff members in the warehouse now as well, like temporary staff members for the next okay. three months. And we have a lot of stock arriving as well. We're focusing a lot on the private suppliers of things. So what have you done to prepare for Q4? Is Q4 like a very big period for you as well? You know, honestly, in the past years, we haven't focused too much on Q4 just because quite honestly, just ignorance, like didn't really understand the game as well as I do now. But I think the first step for Q4 for us um, is forecasting revenue. So what is what is my goal for this Q4? How much money do I want to like do in each month in terms of revenue? And then I work backwards from that. Okay, if I if I say I want this like lofty goal, right? And I want to hit this lofty goal, then I need to place the inventory to like hit that lofty. So I, first I start with the revenue projection and then I place the inventory based on that. And so this Q4 our plans were, um, we want to scale really heavily, you know? And so we have that number and we placed the PO, biggest PO we've ever placed, like placed that like a month ago. Um, it's so that's what like September like yeah September we placed it the massive order um, not taking any chances on like just like delays manufacturing because you know how shit happened in Q4 so like just planning ahead I think is really important for prepping and then just ads like making sure we have a lot of ads ready to test a huge volume of ad creative um, but going back to what you said like I think a lot of people think the marketing is the hardest part like I think that's true when you're like starting out I think the having the marketing hit is like really important to scale but then past yeah like past like seven figures like especially eight figures nine figures from what i've what i've heard from people and what i've learned is okay like i, I met this one guy in thailand bro i was in thailand before china um uh, to visit another factory but we ended up not working with them they th i met this guy there he's doing like nine figures some e-com some like in-person stuff he taught me a really interesting lesson he said the big guys at the very top bro they don't talk about marketing. Like he says only seven figure, eight figure brands really talk about marketing. All the top guys, bro, they're talking about product and supply chain only. And um, yeah, he said almost at the top level, marketing is almost a cost center 
because it's like your product is so good that any ads you run will hit. Any ad you run will hit a 4x fucking ROAS on Facebook. It's just like a cost. Like, oh, just get that shit out of the way. Now we just focus on product and more supply chain. Like, that's that's a big thing I learned. And so I've t- taken a pretty big emphasis off of marketing, actually, in the past few months um, and more on product. And the, the drawback of that is obviously you're going to make less. You might make less revenue. You might do, like, less numbers. Like, oh, like, you have to take a step back. Like, but... Again, going back to like the 10 year time frame, like I'm not playing for the next year's profits. Like I'm playing to dominate in 10 years from now. And so the moves I'm making now will affect that. That makes sense. I think beginners often focus on the wrong thing. Beginners often fo- focus too much on kind of the back end stuff and they worry about like shipping time. They worry about all the kind of stuff that doesn't necessarily matter too much. Yeah. And they don't focus so much on just purely getting as many sales in as possible. And that will kind of solve all the problems you figure everything out. And then kind of people a little bit further on they don't worry about too much of the operations back and stuff. Because like literally over the past three years, like 2021 Q4, 2022, like last year Q4, obviously the biggest period for me. And it's like every single time I fucked up the operations in some way, shape or form, like not having enough staff members or focusing too much on like actually managing the operations myself purely from kind of, probably like an ego point of view. Like I just like yeah. the operation side of stuff, whereas I could just give that to someone else and it'd be way better and fair, make way fair. more fucking money. But um, yeah, like people just focus on the wrong thing too much. And it's super interesting what you say, like at the big, big, big numbers, people just focus purely on supply chain and actually product. Yeah, dude. Everything else. Yeah, that's, that's huge, bro. That's huge. I, I, I like to say sometimes, like I feel like there's two matrices to break out of. Like there's the first one, which is like, obviously like everyone knows that one, the nine to five, like, you know, but I think the second matrix to break out of, and I just call it a matrix because that's how I think. But like, I don't want to say money Twitter, but like the marketing, like, Everyone on Money Twitter talks about marketing, bro. And it's like, ugh, I think it's like a like a matrix on its own. I really do. I think it's like how you get stuck at seven to eight figures is by constantly spending so much time listening to all these other seven to eight figures guys talk about tactics and strategies. Um, yeah. It's I, just a big circle jerk. Everyone's just kind yeah. of like really loving that shit. Yeah, and it's just, yeah. It's because it's sexy and like marketing like, seems interesting and stuff like this. Whereas talking about supply chain just doesn't right excite anyone i really like it like i really <laughs> i really like the warehouse i love the warehouse That's i love crazy, supply right? chain i love that kind of stuff i love like the predictions the spreadsheets shit like that like, it's so difficult so hard like doing predictions for stock and stuff yeah. it's impossible it's not possible it's very difficult when you're growing so much it's very difficult and even for the sweets brand it's so annoying to predict stock because we're relying on suppliers that are like useless and <laughs> Because Damn, bro. let's say like we sell, say, 200 tons of, of one type of sweet a year, right? We sell 200 tons of it a year. But the manufacturer that makes that sweet sells like 10,000 tons. So yeah. they don't give a fuck about our 200 tons for one. Right. And they're selling 10,000 tons of that sweet, but they're selling like 100,000 tons of another. I'm, I'm not like exact numbers, but right, right. they're selling like a ridiculous amount of other sweet. So they don't care about that little 10,000. They don't care about that sweet. So we've had it so many times before where we're in the process of replicating these suites and replicating the actual thing and doing it ourselves. But we've had it before where like a couple of our best sellers, they just stopped the supply of them. Wow. Because it's nothing to them. It's like 1% of their revenue. They don't give a fuck. It's actually annoying. It's a negative to them because yeah, they, yeah. the machinery and stuff like this. But like we, we, that's so annoying to us. That's so incredibly annoying. And because of suites, it's such... The way the margins work, you have to do a ridiculous amount to actually make it worthwhile to mm. put all the manufacturing up and stuff like this. It's very, very difficult to do um, and actually make it cost effective. But like that's a big thing we've struggled with. And often a lot of the times the suppliers won't communicate with you correctly. And like then the suppliers that are smaller and they won't communicate with you correctly and stuff like this. Especially with like damages and heat waves. There's so many, so many right. extra kind of things in terms of the supply chain. And like COVID completely fucked us and so many kind of elements because Europe was like shut down at different points and like some stuff was out of stock. We had one of our best sellers was literally out of stock for like three and a half months. Damn. And we were like fucked. And then the second it came in, we bought as many things as possible and then sold it out. But yeah, it's super, super complicated, the supply chain and stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's the shit I really like, but no one talks about it. Literally no one talks about it. Yeah, not, not enough people talk about it. I think it's like literally one of the most important parts of running a brand. I think also supplier, like picking the right supplier huge bro okay i think picking the supplier is very important but also a lot of people kind of like talk shit about their suppliers but i also think a lot of westerners specifically don't know how to really build relationships with with uh asian suppliers like it's it's a different it's a different culture like i'm asian i'm chinese so like i think i had it naturally a little bit inside of me there's a one of my previous mentors he actually told me a um 
a concept called guanxi. Um, it's a Chinese word. It basically means relationship. But guanxi is very important in China. It's a very, very important, um, almost to the point where, actually, not almost, like to the point where it is, at many times it supersedes a contract, like contractual agreements, like legal contracts, is guanxi, how strong your relationship is. So this, my, uh, my mentor, right, he, he used to run like food packaging uh, company and they were trying to sell their company and he said the buyers came in trying to buy the company he um but they didn't have any contracts in place like they, they were exclusive partnerships but they didn't have any contracts that wrote it out so the buyers wouldn't buy the company they're like you know we can't buy it we need contracts and then my mentor told them explained to them the concept that if we go and ask for contracts right now it's literally offensive these co- these this arguancy with this manufacturer is stronger than what a contract could do and they just don't understand that these Western buyers and I think a lot of Western econ brand owners don't understand the power of Guanxi. So like these these aren't, you know, people to just like like just they supply a product. That's it. And they're like, oh, they're retards, like whatever. Like, dude, they run a business, too. They um, they will reciprocate goodwill like every human being will. Like, for example, one thing that built a lot of Guanxi with us is at the, pretty early in our uh, brand. Actually, we uh, our suppliers, they like were in a crunch for cash. And they're like, yo, like, we like really need this like money. Like, like, do you think you could help us with anything? I literally paid them 30 grand in AliExpress to hit their sales target on AliExpress. And we didn't have any POs. Like this was just money for them floated to them. Like, cause I trusted them at that point. We've done business for a while. I did that for them. And I don't think they ever forgot it. Like truly they've treated me extremely, extremely well. When I went to China, they treated me extremely well. And it's just little things like that, where you build the Guanxi and you actually like build that relationship. I think it can. Yeah, it's it's very very beneficial. Is it just like how do you build that relationship so much stronger? Because I've had some good relationship with suppliers in the past, and now one of our main suppliers for the kind of home goods side of things is it's very good to us. They give us very good like very nice terms. Yeah. They're very quick shipping. They don't fuck us over, and they're super good with like refunds and everything, right? But how do you build kind of a very good relationship with them? Like how do you do it? I think a big part is aligning incentives. So like understand they, they want to make money just like you want to make money. All right. That's the, that's the North Star goal. Now I'll work back from that. Like you want payment terms, let's just say, right. You want to get good payment terms. I don't approach it in the sense that like you go to them and say, give us six, we want 60 day payment terms. Can you give it to us? Why the fuck would they say yes to that? Like there's, you're just making it seem like it's a bad deal for them. When in reality, what you should be doing is looking at that North Star goal, which is we both want to make money. I'm going to tell my supplier like, Hey, if you can give me 60 day payment terms, let me break down the numbers for you. Why this is beneficial for both of us. Like if you can give us 60 day payment terms, we can scale an extra, let's say three X and we're both going to make more money. All you have to do is give us 60 day payment terms. And it's like, can you, do you think you can do that? Like, do you think you can find the event? Like, do you think we can make this work? Like, I just really want both of us to make a lot of money. And I really see a long-term partnership for us here. Like truly incentive, uh, aligning incentives, I think is the best way to negotiate every time i quote unquote negotiate with suppliers it's not negotiation it's literally just telling them like yo if you can do this for us we'll both make more money um that's how i think about negotiating and like building relationships is honestly just like i don't know i don't know how to explain it like just be a good person like be respectful to them they'll respect you like fucking keep your word you know pay on time fucking do good numbers sell and, and also like tell your vision to them like i mean if you're just a drop shipping brand like and you're just trying to fucking use a supplier for three months and then fuck off. Like, okay, I don't know how good of a relationship you can really expect with a supplier. Like, like that's your goal. But like, if you're really trying to build something long-term, like sell them on the vision, like tell them what you want to do. Tell them what your dream ideal scenario is with a manufacturer and tell them like what that would mean for them if your vision was fulfilled. And like, just, yeah, just like anyone, like bring them onto the vision, like sell them on it. Yeah, it makes sense. Like actually sell to the supplier, actually build something yeah. as if they're, yeah, like they're a partner essentially. Yeah, because they are like, yeah. yeah. Like, it's so important, so incredibly important. Like building a actual good relationship like even um with some of our suppliers like our uk based suppliers like purely just through the relationship point of view we have like very good payment terms and there's no like contractual agreement there's no like anything but we've had up to like 60 days even like longer than 60 days sometimes just payment terms with our suppliers even though every single other customer pays like the second they receive the order (laughs) but we've just built that relationship and we do everything kind of without contracts and we have a very good relationship with all of them Switching the, the topic slightly, but how did you originally kind of come across the idea to do it like an iced jewelry brand? How did that originally start? Bro, I started in math class when I was in sophomore year of high school. I was in school at the time and I was I was trying to get into e-commerce. I was doing e-commerce already, actually. I had a like semi 
tiny successful store, like five figures in, uh, in high school. But I was doing product research <clears throat> in math class, I remember so vividly. Um, it's on AliExpress. I saw this product. It was an iced, iced pendant. I'm like, damn, that's sick. Like, I fucking love ice jewelry. I was, like, super into rap. Like, I love hip-hop jewelry and shit like that. But I didn't think much of it. I just scrolled scrolled past. And I actually tested, like, five products um, after I first discovered the concept of ice jewelry as a product. Um, until, like, probably six months later, I went back. I'm like, damn, that is a sick product. So I went and tried it. Um, I created Ice Mob. And, I, and it took off. But I think <clears throat> what really made the difference was the other five products I tested were, like, water bottles, fucking spice racks like i'm sure everyone's tested that one general stores like but i didn't give a shit about any of these ice jewelry i I genuinely liked and i found myself working on it a lot because like i really liked the product um i love the product actually and i think that's what made the difference you know like i think the the marketing you could see the the difference in quality you could see the different in difference in dedication to the brand um in the passion for the product. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's really what made the difference. Why do you think, because obviously there's, there's quite a lot of kind of ice brand competition and stuff like this. Like <clears throat> it's been a trending kind of well-known product. And I remember a lot of people were drop shipping it and stuff like this. I even remember like Supreme Patty is like the ice oh, yeah, jewelry right. shit and like free plus shipping, this kind of stuff, right? So how do you differentiate yourself from kind of the really cheap competitors? Yeah, And then also how did you like, struggle against the competitors like was there a big struggle there was there a point that it was very difficult dude when i started i wasn't even smart enough to think about competition like i really was just trying to do i was just trying to make something work you know i was young um but more recently right like yes there's a lot of there's a lot of players in this market but I, i really don't see much competition because no one no brand is trying to do what we're trying to do we're trying to like talking about blue ocean strategy red ocean strategy i don't know if you know about that but basically carving out a niche not a niche, but a market of your own where you're literally not competing with anyone. That's our goal. We're not trying to be like any of the brands on the market. I think that's really important. A lot of people who build brands, they like kind of idolize some brands, let's say, or they try to copy a brand. But like, I mean, it's just like everyone knows it's like you can't you can't exceed a brand that you're trying to copy. Like, how is that going to work? You need to really go your own path. And so we're trying to go our own path. We're like, we're not, we, we basically want to be below the super high luxury overpriced diamond chain bullshit essentially like i'm just gonna say how it is but and then but still like way above all the rest of the jewelry brands who basically sell affordable jewelry which is like cool it's like a market on its own we're not trying to sell affordable jewelry we're also not trying to sell super overpriced like insanely luxurious jewelry so right now our price point is around like 100 150 bucks but we're going to be completely elevating the product soon like completely new materials like a complete brand revamp coming soon um that's going to like essentially like really increase our price point, but it, it's not going to be like, oh, we just increase our price. Like it's like the products are going to cost way more for us, but it's because it's a dedication to quality. Like I think just looking at the market, looking at all your competitors and being like, okay, they're all doing this. Like what do, first of all, what do I want to do? Cause your biggest conv- competitive advantage is you, what you have uniquely, uh, whether it's the brand positioning, whether it's the product designs, like what, what you love is your biggest competitive advantage. And then on top of that, seeing what the gap in the market is, like what, is no one else doing. And there's no ice jewelry brand right now for men that's really like elevated um, at a price point that's like attainable, right? Like beyond, be, like under $10,000. There's literally no ice jewelry brand that's trying to, that's trying to like just be elevated and, and like a brand people wanna wear. And so, and there's more, and I don't wanna, you know, leak too much of what our plans are. There's a lot more, but yeah, that, that's what it is. Just identifying the gap in the market and trying to go for that. So why, so, so when you drastically increase the quality, obviously your cost of goods are going to drastically increase. So you're drastically increasing the price, right? Yeah. Why? Because it's getting out of the cesspit that is competition. They always say like competition is for losers. We don't want any competition, right? Why would I? I, I don't want to be, I don't even want IceMop to be in the same conversation as the other brands that are trying to do dropshipping or whatever. Like, that's cool. You guys can have that market. Like, we don't really care about that. We're not in the business of competing with everyone. Like we just want to build our own product, like get the best product in the world and are in our own category. So that's why the price, um, the price is going to be elevated because you, you, there's, there's a book called the brand gap, which is an amazing book, but it basically talks about like you, um, the, the, the most premium brand in any like market gets like the lion's share. You know what I mean? Rolex gets the lion's share. Mercedes gets the lion's share. Like all these other brands who are trying to compete on price and affordability and like, like you just like, bro, we, we said like Forever 21, 
um, fucking H&M. Like, all these brands are forgettable. Louis Vuitton at the top. Fucking richest man in the world. Like, yeah, Bernardo yeah, Noble. Like, yeah. the, the luxury, like, raising your price to a point where it's not in the same category as everyone else. That's important. Um, that's important to creating a brand that's truly luxurious, in my opinion. And, and a brand that people love is, yeah, just like just creating a cool product and also like really investing a lot of money in the product takes money. So you got to increase the prices. Like it's, it's what it is. And also materials elevation, like all of that. Yeah. It makes sense. So obviously you've been working in this brand for like three years now. How, like what are some kind of like the biggest kind of things that you've seen? Obviously you mentioned right at the beginning, focusing the basics and stuff like that. Is there anything else that you would say like, because obviously you're going for the 10 year mark. What is your vision for the brand coming to the 10 year mark? And what is someone like, it's just starting now, maybe at the one year mark, something like this. Like how how has your vision changed, let's say, over the past couple of years, going to the ten year mark, going for the long term vision? Like, what is really your focus, and how has mm. it changed since you, when since when you originally started? That's, that's a really good question. Like, well, I think at the beginning, again, I, I was young, I didn't really know much, so I was just doing it to make money. And I think that's the biggest thing. Like, if you're like if you're starting a brand like year one, right? Like, I think the most important thing is getting clear on what it is you want. Right. So like, do you want to be building a brand for 10 years? Do you want to be doing something for life or do you want like something for your lifestyle or do you want something for like this? And there's no right or wrong answer. Like only you can answer what you want out of your, the business that you're building. So like, for example, a lot of people I know, like they want to build a brand for three to five years, exit, you know, and take that money and either start another business or like go live on a like whatever. But um, I think just being clear with yourself because all of your goals align with that, right? Like you can't, you can't say you want to build a brand for whatever, like a decade. And then you spend all the money on lifestyle shit. And it's like, like, it just doesn't work. Like, so just be clear. If you want a brand for lifestyle, like build it for lifestyle. If you want a brand to truly become great and like your actions need to reflect that. Um, I think my vision has changed. So at the beginning, I, I think I was like, I literally was a kid, bro. I just wanted to make money. So that's what it was at the beginning. Just make money. And then, after i think you can relate to this but like when you start making a certain amount of money like additional income doesn't really change your life you know and so at that point i'm like all right well like i don't really know what i want to do but like i love this brand like okay i realize i don't want to do this for money anymore like i genuinely want to create something super sick um i genuinely want to create a brand that's amazing and so i made that shift pretty recently actually like probably like a year ago i was walking out a park in miami listening to an alex becker video talking about uh, long term and thinking and stuff like that, and I just made the switch. I'm like, all right, like this this decision is clear in my head. I want to do this for the next ten years. So at that point, I made a switch in all, you know, the business direction and all the actions that we're taking to optimize for the ten year win. Because like, and I say ten year, bro. I I genuinely think I might do Ice Mop for the rest of my life, because there's it's a vehicle in my opinion to do so much more. Like jewelry is like jewelry is jewelry. Like at the end of the day, it's just jewelry. But a brand is so much more than that. You can do so much with a brand. Um, I have a lot of, yeah, I'll keep it at that. Like, there's, it's a vehicle to do a lot more um, in the future, which is why I could I could potentially see myself doing Ice Mop for the rest of my life. Okay. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That's super, I completely relate to the the branding aspect as well. And then also, yeah, like, you get to a certain level in money where it's, it's kind of doesn't drastically increase lifestyle if you get more money. Like, yeah. beyond, like, I don't know. What? I don't know what the number is. 10K, 20K, whatever. Yeah. I don't know what the number is, but like... <laughs> you whatever. see people on Twitter saying like 50K. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know. But it's like, it doesn't drastically increase lifestyle. Like, yeah, you can start flying like first class versus like business, but it's not drastic. It's not as such as drastic from like 1K to 10K. Like that's yeah. a massive jump. Yeah, and then 10K yeah, to 20 is like very, very minimal to be honest. And it, that's crazy that you want to do it for the next like 10 years. Like, I, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Like 10 years, <laughs> I have no idea. Or like, even the rest of your life. And that's crazy. Yeah. Do you want to keep it the kind of e-commerce side of things? Or do you have any plans to go into physical? Yeah, I have a lot of plans. I mean, obviously those are super long-term plans. And so like, I don't even really like speaking on it because it's like, by the time I get there, wherever, five, 10 years from now, like everything will be different. I'll, I'll be in a completely different, I'll have a different level of knowledge. I'll have a more data. Like I always think like I'm climbing a ladder and once I get to the top of the ladder, like five years from now, I'll, ha I'll see from a higher vantage point. Right now I'm like trying to guess in the dark. So I don't really, I have like visions of and dreams of what I want to do. A lot, a lot to do with physical. Um, but right now I'll just head down working and, and just building the brand. Like that's what's most important. That's cool. That's super cool. So one thing, one thing that I say a lot but I feel like you kind of, I know you're going to disagree with this, but I say like, don't, when you first originally start, don't 
do something you're passionate about. Don't do something you're interested in. Just purely follow the money, get your own understanding and then kind of build from there, right? Would you agree with that? Because I know you did a little bit of dropshipping before you mm-hmm. five figures kind of stuff and then you went into something that you're passionate about and you really loved. What's yeah. your kind of opinion on that? Would you say to a beginner, it's like there's loads of new people watching this right now that have probably ne- never started an e-commerce brand or have just kind of come across e-commerce yeah. right now. So would you say like focusing on a kind of a passion is a good idea or a bad idea? I don't think it's so binary, but like, dude, when you're broke, your passion is money, bro. So do it, like, make money. Like, when I was, when I was a, like a kid, bro, I had no money. Like, dude, I didn't give a fuck about anything else besides just making money. Like, I was doing anything to make money. Literally anything. I right, chill, not everything. <laughs> but I was doing a lot to make money. And like, so I, I, I kind of agree. Like, I don't think you, sh- you really have, I don't think you can afford to focus on what you're passionate about um, when you're broke. Like, you just have to make money. I think once you get to a point where you're somewhat secure, like, I think again it just goes back to what you want like do you want to do you want to make 10 10k a month do you want to make 50k a month like okay if that's the case you can build a business for that and just focus on the money and you don't have to do a business you're passionate about um in my opinion to get to like the nine figure level 10 figure level like you need to be passionate about it and if if you're not passionate about it like some people like you have to be passionate about the the game like yeah that's what i was gonna say because some people run businesses that they hate but they love the game of business. And so in my opinion, they're still passionate about it, just in a different way. It's because the money kind of becomes almost secondary or almost kind of unimportant. It's more just kind of like actually doing it and seeing the progression. That, for me yeah. personally, like I really love to see the progression. I don't really care about the money or spending the money. It's more just like seeing the up, 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 up. Perhaps, yeah. That's what I love rather than like the money. But yeah, I don't think you need to be passionate about the specific business to see it successful. You just need to be passionate about the game. I agree. I would agree with that. I mean, honestly, it's, it's different for everybody. Like for me, I, I have to be passionate about what I'm doing just because like, man, I have enough money to live. Like, why would I work on something I don't love just for more money? Like that doesn't make sense in my head. So I want to do something I love every day. I want to wake up feeling hyped about what I'm going to work on. Like that's important to me. But again, everyone's everyone's got their own preferences. Like, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think for me, I with especially with the licorice brand, I, I talk about that a lot. But with the licorice brand, I have such an emotional connection to it because it's the thing I started like three and a half years ago. It's like it's kind of been with me through the kind of most of the steps that I've done um, through like massive changes in my life, like personally and also in business as well. Yeah. Like that's always been running in the background. So I have, I was never passionate about that in the beginning. I just purely did it for money. But then kind of over the years, I've formed kind of like a passion about that, like random fucking tiny little weird niece <laughs> licorice. Like, like most people don't even know what the fuck it is. <laughs> so like you kind of fall in love with certain things as well and you fall kind of passionate around the, the brand and obviously about the love of the game and improving it. Like if I had to work on anything, like it's that kind of brand. Um, purely sick, because bro. I just, it doesn't earn the most money by far, <laughs> by far. But it's something that's really cool and something that's really interesting and something that teaches me a lot every single day as well. That's sick, bro. I also just want to say, bro, like we haven't talked a lot since we met like a year and a half yeah, like it's real. Bro, I've just been seeing you from afar though like and just elevating, bro, like on every front. So I just want to say like, bro, I'm happy for you, bro. Like, that's sick. Thanks. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Licorice is sick too. I don't know too much about it. I gotta try one of your products. <laughs> yeah, you're American, you, so you don't you don't know like shit. Like we, no we, one knows about this shit. We only have Twizzlers, bro. Yeah, I know you have the random like red and black stuff, but we have ass, bro. Well, I should have bought some. I have some back at the house, I think. Damn, but bro. it's like, we sell salted shit. It's like the most weird niche <laughs> shit ever. We have spicy stuff. Like it's the most weird thing ever, but it creates like such good customers because mm. it's such a weird niche thing. You can't buy it in the supermarket. Oh. There's very little competition. Wow. Like we, our prices are like 30% higher than our nearest competition. It's the exact same products. It's like sweets. It's basically commoditized. Wow. Uh, but we focus so much on branding and it's just, yeah, like our top customer is like 70 orders on our website. And it's like, Sick. I think it's 65% returning customers over the past year. Sick. But because we haven't been focusing on new customers, but mm-hmm. still, it's still like ridiculous amount just returning customers. That's it. Like if we did no front end, we basically done no front end for the past like year, year and a half. Just started it back wow. up now. That's crazy. What, what are your plans with that? Like organic, like ads? So right now we're just trying to get the costs right. So our cost per purchase, the way the licorice brand works, um, the sweets brand works is because the AOV, the first purchase average order value is like 25 pound with our margins and with the way Facebook and Instagram ads are, it's very difficult to make money on the first purchase. Mm. Like very difficult. Yeah. Unless we just like drastically go high for AOV, it's very difficult to actually make money on that first purchase. So what we've, 
basically we're just trying to optimize the ads now and just try and get back into it but it's just effort to get it up to scale where it's kind of worth my time pretty yeah, much yeah. it's like with everything else going on it's very difficult to get it to a point that it's like worth me spending 10 hours on it a week or something yeah. like that. it's like 20 hours on it a week it's difficult so we're just trying to ramp it up now really focus on the returning like customers sending like eight emails a month like six to eight emails a month like blasting the list um and also really focusing on getting because we have like thirty six thousand customers like forty thousand customers something like this that purchased from us to date really trying to get them to come back over and over and over again and um we're just focusing on a bunch of different stuff we're starting a like referral program we're going to massively push yeah. referrals we're also going to do like a subscription model as well for customers that have purchased that have been on an email list we're going to segment it massively, basically. We're just going like much more into kind of the stats and behind the brand and really try and capitalize on the brand equity that we have, right. but we haven't actually like used properly in the past like two years. Yeah, that makes sense. And just really ramp up first post, like really ramp up the ads, basically. That's, that's what's up, bro. I know that feeling of just like having so much on your plate, but like not being able to capitalize on it all. I think that's like, I think the biggest bottleneck is execution. Like being able to execute on everything at once, it's so difficult. Um, yeah yeah for me there's like two two like ways i try to because dude like at any given time there's there's literally hundreds of things to do on, on an econ brand i think like first of all is like picking having the clarity to know which ones are actually important and which ones are just a waste of your time um like the 80 20 rule and whatnot like it's very important to follow that i think also like building out teams to to that are able to execute on a lot of the stuff that aren't that you shouldn't be executing on as ceo and I think on the final thing is like just focusing on the basics, like really narrowing down. Like, dude, like there's still like since since I started focusing on basics before that, right? There's a hundred things to do. Now there's still a hundred things to do. It's just I only do like three of them. Yeah. You know, and that's like that's how I keep saying because. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stuff to do for sure. It, there's so much stuff to do because even recently, like I went and visited the warehouse back in the UK, and I walked in, and I was like. Like 50, there's like 50 things I can see that need to be done I'm like for fuck's sake so then it's like okay and it's like trying to stop myself from just physically doing them because I, I I love the warehouse like so much I love being in there and I love I love I love like last year I was doing 16 hour days in the warehouse just purely just working hustling and just trying to get out of the orders because we basically fucked up so much with the operations yeah and it was so much work and we had to hire new staff members trying to grab staff members from absolutely everywhere right and even the year before that we're kind of doing this it was very hectic but it's just kind of now what I'm really focusing on is like I have one particular staff member trying to put a lot of the the licorice load on him and try and trying to my to the best of my ability to train him to kind of mimic what I would do in certain situations. Yeah. So it's kind of doing like very regular calls with him so I can then just kind of trust him to do a lot of the decision making and then I can focus on the kind of bigger things. Yeah. Or so pretty much what we're trying to do is like trust him to put on the get the returning customers coming in so he focuses on pure just retention building the kind of brand and really building that up just as i would okay. so i can focus on just kind of front end optimizing the front end so we can get it profitable because if we get the front end profitable it's infinitely scalable because yeah. we know x amount of our customers come back month one month two month three up up to like three years nice. we have a lot of customers now even recently because we're really heavily focusing our um, email and sms marketing to the customers that purchased like two years ago, two and a half years ago. So we have a lot of customers that originally purchased from us, like 2021, that are now coming back again because we're giving them special deals, we're giving them special offers and stuff like this. So that's something that we're really focusing on. And then it's very different for us, product side of things as well, but your product is obviously a lot more complicated than ours. Ours is very simple to do, um, but we're really focusing on the, the product side of things as well and bringing out new products and um, trying that side of things as well yeah like really focusing on product because we haven't done many updated products in the past kind of two years or so Got you. super interesting yeah our products might be a little bit more complicated but you guys have way more complicated supply chain dude <laughs> melting bro i don't want to be even think about that <laughs> it's such a pain get a shipload of sticky liquor bro, bro. it's, horrible. Oh, it's, it's like we sell chocolate as well we sell chocolate oh coated. no way yeah so like heat wave and stuff like this <sighs> it's it's a headache yeah, it's that such sounds, a big headache it sounds like a headache man it's such a big headache because we sell certain types of sweets and it's just purely the margin based thing. Like we can't, like we sell 70, 70 different products, like 140 SKUs, right? Because we have different uh -huh. sizing. And some products, maybe we sell 40 pieces of a month, but it still makes money. Like it's still worth it to sell. If it sells like 10 pieces, it's not fucking worth it. But yeah. if it sells like 40, 50, 100 pieces a month, that's worth it to sell for us. 
Yeah. But there's no way that we're going to go out and actually manufacture that product. So if like that one gets cut or there's an issue with that, it just leads to, mm-hmm. there's so much complexity with that many SKUs and the, the way the supply chain is, is very, very annoying. Yeah, reducing complexity is like so important too, bro. Also, headaches are good, bro. That's what I've learned. It's like the bigger the headache you're running your brand is, the better it is because that just means everyone else isn't willing to do it. Like the bigger the headache, the better. So like, dude, there's a feeling when you go to China. I know I've been talking to China a lot, but like, dude, there's a feeling when you go there, it's like, holy fuck, nobody else is here, bro. Nobody else is like, no white person is coming to China and eating this like, bro, the food is like, man, I, I can't say many nice things about the food in China, bro. Like, I love Chinese food, but it's just so hard to find healthy food out there. Like, you don't feel that good when you're there. It's just, like, not the best time. But it's still fun because, like, while you're there, it's just satisfying, dude. It's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm on a quest that not many not many people are on. That's – so, yeah, headaches I love. Come that's on. Yeah, like, that's the thing. Like, so many people focus on the easy route. And then typically kind of a lot of the shit that I've done is always focusing on the harder route of things. Mm. Especially, like, so many people – focus on just purely drop shipping and they don't go any any extra steps than that which is yeah. way harder it's way more complicated because you've got the marketing side of things and then you're dealing with like all the operation side of things and then the bulk stock side of things and it's a lot more risk in terms of product and stuff like this so it's like but that's where you make the most money exactly yeah. because there's less competition higher barrier to entry so it's much much more upside long term but it's just harder yeah for sure for sure yeah, the amount of dropshippers I know that like are trying to switch to a brand now or like just wish they started it earlier is it's a lot. But dropshipping still has its like it's it's a good it's a very good cash flow business. Like it's a very good beginner business model as well, in my opinion. It's yeah. Yeah, I think it's super, yeah. super good. I know a lot of dropshippers that have tried to transition over transition over to the brand stuff and they fail. Yeah, it's hard. Like it's just hard, man. There's a lot more pieces like just like just the inventory part alone having inventory versus not having inventory bro that's like 30 percent of a business <laughs> it's like adding a whole other business to your existing business it's, it's a lot to manage but it's, it's good man yeah i wouldn't want it any other way like the barrier to entry is high for like to, to try to come into what we're doing or like to start a brand that another person's been doing for like many many years it's extremely hard and that's the moat like it's extremely hard to get there so not many people will it's know? really hard yeah, yeah. Like even before I started talking about the licorice brand online, because that's got quite a low barrier to entry. It's quite easy okay. to like actually get into it in a sense. It's quite, quite easy to actually buy the stock and actually do it yourself. But before I actually started talking about it online, I tried to replicate it and I tried to steal it and try to fuck with my own brand pretty much to kind of test, test to see if I could run Facebook ads and it would work within the same niche. Oh, wow. And it just completely utterly failed. Like it just, I spent like a grand, no, like I think 1500 pound like testing and trying to see if I could actually fuck with shit. That's interesting. And purely because we've just demolished the whole of Facebook and we kind of, I don't know why necessarily, but we seem to just own the whole thing and you can't even fuck with us on the kind of Facebook side of things which is super cool super <laughs> yeah, good it's, it's, yeah. because when we came in we were so aggressive when we came in we went from like our original cost per purchase cost per acquisition was like five pound now it's sitting at like 13 like we came wow. in just like demolished the whole market <laughs> like <laughs> like if you like sweets in any way shape or form in the UK and you're all of our like 40 to 60 year old <laughs> demographic you've probably seen our ad like once That's or twice funny, like we've demolished the market Totally. that's awesome it's fucking sick yeah <laughs> but now we're now one thing um we're kind of in negotiations around is trying to bring into the the physical space and try and, and try mm. and go down that route it's very difficult but um i think that's kind of the next step for us which is just gonna be something that's really really interesting that's an interesting step yeah it's very interesting one of my friends is trying to head into retail as well not retail just physical but like voodoo that's yeah, we're, I don't actually think we want to do retail for a long time, like anything physical, but it seems like a headache all on its own. Um, seems interesting though, seems fun. You know, I, I always think like whether I want, because sometimes I think about building like an office almost, like office slash in, like, uh, in-house warehouse, like all in one spot. But then it's like you're tied down to location. You know, it's funny, I watched a video with uh, George, it was, it was George Heaton and Iman Ghazi together. And Iman yeah, Ghazi nice. doesn't have a physical office, all the team is remote. George Eaton does have an office. All their team is in one spot. And it's so funny. Iman was like, this is such a sick office. And then George was like, yeah, nah, dude, this. I want what yeah, you, I want you have. have. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, who knows what the, what the optimal route is. Bro, I've kind of done both. Not with like a big, big team, but I've kind of done a bit of both. So originally like we had an office. 
So like three years ago, we had an office, um, me and my partner, we had an office like together. And then we kind of scaled up from there. That's when we started the licorice brand. So then we got an extra office to package the licorice. Then we got an extra one to like store it as well. So we were working out of basically like a WeWork Regis oh, office. Nice. It's horrendous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, but it was really fun. Yeah. We made like no fucking money, but it was really fun. Like we had strippers in the office. Like we'd always <laughs> smoke Was it a WeWork? Yeah, it was oh, like, a, it was a Regis. Right. So it was a WeWork. So it was in the shared conference room. We had a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> Late at night, it was, it was horrendous. Like we'd always drink, we'd bring girls back to the office, stuff like this. My partner, he he actually blew up a mattress in the in like the licorice office, and like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's dumb as fuck, but it was a lot of fun. And you kind of reach a different level of like collaboration when you're working with someone. The warehouse is right there because then it's like, okay, we need to do new ads. Okay, let's just yeah. go get this product. Let's get this product. Okay, we have we have the lighting set up, we have the white background, we have everything there ready to go. And then even we moved the warehouse like quite far away because it was a lot cheaper stuff and it was a lot better. And um, we kind of removed that that aspect of like the collaboration because it was sure. just the warehouse. There was no offices. And then it's all kind of gone on remote now. But we're actually kind of going back to the offices even as well. We're going back to the offices now pretty soon. So we're going down that route. And I think that's gonna be, again, super interesting. But there's no like perfect thing because yeah. the warehouse is such a headache such a headache to manage and such a headache to figure out that I don't, I don't know if it's worth it. It's fun though, like the warehouse and the offices and shit like that. Like it's a lot of fun, but it's it's a lot of work at the same time. Yeah, it does. That's the end of the podcast. I hope you guys liked it. I hope you guys got value. If you did, make sure you subscribe. Thank you very much to Kevin for coming on here and Appreciate talking you, about man. branding. I think it's super good. A little bit different to most of the podcasts that I've done. Most of them are talking about Etsy, but this is something that I find really interesting and I'm trying to obviously create content that I would watch and I would have appreciated when I first started and first got into kind of Shopify and Etsy and all this kind of stuff. So make sure you subscribe. We'll put your Instagram or Twitter or something down below. Go, go give Kevin a follow. And um, we'll thing. see you guys. One more thing, bro. I'll get you dripped out for the podcast, bro. What the fuck is this? <laughs> what the fuck is this? Looks like an ornament. Yeah, you just, just throw it over here. All right, this is Craig the Baller. He just elevated his entire YouTube game with this new chain now. This is great. I feel, I feel rich finally. Dude, I saw this in China. I was like, no way people buy this. And then the, the, it wasn't my supplier. It was another supplier. They're like, it's actually one of our best sellers. <laughs> I was like, no fucking way, dude. Who's copping this shit, bro? What the fuck is this bullshit? That's actually kind of cool though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flip it up on short form. This is go great. Viral. It looks fucking wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, thank you very much for watching. See you guys in the next one. Peace.